Ozaki Arts and Book Festival 2021 online. I am Toby Lawson and I welcome you to my book chat with Fola Fagule and Feyi Fawaimi, who have both written an excellent book titled Formation, The Making of Nigeria from Jihad to Amalgamation. You're welcome, guys. Hello. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I know you guys must be tired of this question, but I have to ask you, why history, especially given both your backgrounds in finance and all that? So why have you chosen to collaborate on this particular project and why history? Are you reading the mood of the country or is it because history is no longer taught in our schools, sadly? I mean, what were you thinking? Why history? As to why did we collaborate, both of us, I mean, Fola and I we became friends online, like people do, and then the friendship spilled over into real life. And we got talking over and over again. Um, over time, I discovered Fola had made a lot of personal investments in understanding Nigeria. You know, he's someone who works in finance in Nigeria, and he had made a lot of investments, both time and money, trying to understand the country better. You know, and I always thought that. I wanted to write a book someday. So, you know, after one of our conversations, I thought, okay, maybe let's do this together. You know, he bought into the idea. As to why history, I think my simple answer would be that there's a lot of flying blind going on in Nigeria. You know, we are people who are very, very susceptible to making the same mistakes over and over again, just because people don't realize that actually, maybe this thing has been done before or is a tried and tested part of our history and the outcomes are predictable in terms of if you go down a certain route. But fundamentally, we chose the 19th century because it's one of the least covered parts of Nigerian history. It used to be, you know, well covered in the past, but like you mentioned, the fact that we don't teach history like we should has meant that many Nigerians, you know, especially when you combine with the fact that we have a very, very young demographic, you know, vast majority of the population are, are 30 years and under, you can have a situation whereby a lot of people might just think that the 19th century actually didn't exist because it's a black hole for many people. So as we studied and we thought that this was where we could add value, if you like, in terms of bringing that very, very important formative century to life and to bring it to a new generation, what we would call our own generation, the younger people, the generation we belong to, you know, who might be hearing some of these stories for the first time, or, and if we could present it to them in a language that they will understand, and relate it to today's Nigeria, you know, understanding where you're coming from, and then being able to make more meaning of Nigeria of today, why it is the way it is, and maybe if we want different outcomes, what can we do differently? So that'll be my answer to that question. And if I understand the process, you guys did this remotely. So what was the collaboration? What was it like, especially given the pandemic in the last year and everything and the whole research process? What was it like for you? What were the challenges and what were the surprises? And what were the bits that you guys enjoyed, you know, while working on this? I think I would like for Allah to answer that. Yes, uh, you know, actually, we started working on formation long before the pandemic. A lot of the actual writing had actually been done prior to the pandemic. A lot of the research had been done prior. Uh, for example, from my perspective, I always tell people that I did most of my share of the writing. I actually did it on airplanes on the way to visit with my clients in the different parts of Africa that I traveled to. And so every time I would travel, I would have the books I was reading to do the research with me. And then obviously I'll have my laptop and I'll do some drafting as well. Um, so we started working on this long before the pandemic. Indeed, the pandemic had a major impact on how this book was produced because a lot of the publishing was done remotely. And so, you know, big ups to Cassava Republic because uh, Bibi Bakari Yusuf and her team did essentially all of the work to publish, market, distribute this book uh, remotely. And they did it in record time as well. In terms of how the research process went, we relied a lot on first-hand records in existing books, very often rare books, books, research papers, academic papers, many of which are available online. A lot of the books we were able to acquire actually you know purchase those books 
the ones that were so rare that we couldn't buy, we could find them in the British Library, for example. So he spent a lot of time in the British Library and in other sources that we could sort of get excerpts from. Uh, a lot of these books, thankfully, have been digitized. And so you could also get like digital versions of the books, even where the rare physical copy was, was not available. So I would say that formation would not be possible without Amazon. It would not be possible without the internet. Uh, it would not be possible without a huge amount of work that has been done on digitizing historical records that we were able to then access first-hand sources of material that were useful to ultimately uh, produce information. I really enjoyed this book so much. I can't say that enough. You started with the geography around the river Niger. And I mean, such elegantly described and written. How did geography shape the sociology and the politics of the people that settled around the Niger? You know, what can you tell us about that? I'll stick with Fola with that question. Yeah, no, thanks, Toby. It's, it's a very important question. And the reason why we started the book with a detailed description of the lay of the land was exactly because geography has had a huge impact on what Nigeria is, particularly the two rivers that define Nigeria. And one of the questions we wanted to ask and answer emphatically was, you know, why does this country exist? You know, a lot of people have many different reasons as to why Nigeria exists. Some of them believe it's because of British imperialism. People believe, you know, any number of things as to why Nigeria exists. But we came up with this thesis that Nigeria exists because of those rivers. Those rivers brought people together from many different parts of the world in ancient and prehistoric times even. Those rivers contribute significantly to there being so much life around these lands. Because if you think about it, beyond those rivers, you have the Sahara Desert, you have a lot of arid land, essentially, which has been the case for centuries. But those rivers attracted people. People settled around those rivers because it was less arid, it was more fertile. And then also the rivers formed important transportation arteries for people to move up and down and communicate and interact. But as we did that research, it also became clear that in spite of the rivers which serve to connect these lands, there's also been other factors that have divided these people. And the legacy of the slave trade then became very clear as something that you know needs to be described, the impact of the slave trade on dividing the people's you know, centuries-long slave trade, more than 400 years of particularly the transatlantic slave trade, but also the trans-Saharan slave trade as well, serving to divide and disrupt trade and, and just create a political economy that was very, very specific in the history of the world that then existed in these parts. And then the slave trade combined to significantly affect the character of this country long before anything else came. I'm randomizing who I'm directing my questions to, but I have my guesses about who wrote which parts, which I'm not going to reveal. We start with the life of Usman Danfodio. I'm just curious, and this is for Faye, why choose this starting point? Because my reading of that is that, of course, the Aousa lands we know have been existing as states for centuries, even before the caliphate. So my reading of that is the caliphate was like the first attempt at centralization, you know, building a sort of central state. But I'm sure you have a lot more to tell us regarding that. So why was that such a momentous start, so to speak? When we started talking about the book, you know, this was one of the things that I've Fola mentioned, and he said, look, this jihad was a defining moment for Nigeria, you know, for the, the country as we know it today. And, you know, I think it was a good thing that I didn't really have any strong views on that. So I sort of was guided by what the evidence was. And I always tell people that before this book, I mean, down for you, you know, to put it in a lighthearted manner, was just a guy who had a quote in front of the Guardian newspaper to me, you know, there's a, the, that quote has been there all my life, you know, conscience is an open wound, only truth can heal it, you know, but then as we dug deeper into the research, you know, I came around to that view that yes, this was a very, very 
important moment, that jihad. And like you rightly mentioned, you know, the Hausa states were already there, but, you know, there was something we alluded to in the book whereby you see when the jihad kicked off in Gobir and the other Hausa states pretty much just left Gobir to sort itself out. They didn't take it as if, oh, an attack on Gobir is an attack on Hausa land. Everyone sort of fortified themselves and said, look, whatever is happening in Gobir, we just want to make sure that it doesn't spread here, you know. And when the battle was almost being lost, you could see that the the leader of Gobir was writing to the other house leader, warning them and telling them effectively that, look, I've allowed a small fire to start in my domain. I didn't handle it in time. And now it's become a conflagration. So basically saying, look, just be warned. So you could see a kind of relationship there whereby they were so-called sister states, but really everyone ran their own thing, you know, in their own way. The coming of the caliphate was a big difference in the sense that, first of all, you know, the caliphate at its height was the largest bureaucracy in sub-Saharan Africa at the time. You know, so what Dan Fodio and his sons and generals and soldiers, what they did was to build something in the model of the Abbasid Caliphate. You know, and these guys were educated. They were well read. They knew what was going on in the world. And then they model a state that was partly decentralized because emirs had a say in how they ran their domain. But everyone was, you know, basically reported to Sokoto, if you like. So all of a sudden, you had a different kind of structure, a superstructure, if you like. So I guess a way to put it would be that if a jihad had kicked off under the caliphate, in, say, Nupeland, where there was an emir, for example, there will never have been the same reaction where Sokoto will just leave Nupe to sort itself out and not intervene. You know, we saw that over time, whereby if there was an attack on one part of the caliphate, then Sokoto would have found it important to send reinforcements, send soldiers, send everything. You know, I mean, we saw even 100 years after the caliphate, we saw this in the Battle of Bidda when, you know, the British were storming bid and we saw that the caliphate Sokoto sent reinforcements they couldn't get there but they did send reinforcements so i guess this was the big difference in the sense that we take the jihad as the starting point of somebody bringing all these disparate groups and make no mistake about it even within the caliphate as much as it was one Sokoto caliphate with emirs all over the place there was a huge amount of diversity some places were uprising the whole time the whole period of the caliphate. But this was the first attempt at someone consolidating all these different groups, which will I mentioned about, you know, different people being attracted to the space we know as Nigeria because of the rivers, because of the fertile land. But all these different groups, this was the first time someone made a huge attempt at consolidating a wide swath of land. And it went from Sokoto and they attempted Meduguri as well, as we saw in the book. They didn't quite um, have success, but they went all the way from Sokoto and you could see with what Modibu Adama did in Adamawa as well. So the caliphate cut across what we see as northern Nigeria today. And it was a big deal at the time. There were kingdoms, obviously. There were kingdoms all over the place, different kingdoms, but none of them quite covered the length and breadth of what the caliphate did and the superstructure that they put in place where the Sokoto Caliphate sitting on top of a number of different states who had some autonomy, but within a federal structure, if you like. So I think that that fact of what the jihad did, how the jihad changed the relationship between those pre-existing house states you mentioned and the new relationship that it formed, I think we thought that that might be a good starting point to say, look, Nigeria, as we know it today, the people in within the space of Nigeria have obviously existed for hundreds of years. I mean, we know 500 years. We don't know even what happened before Europeans started coming. But for what we know as Nigeria today, you know, that jihad contributed a big part into kickstarting that process. I'm going to follow now and further on that uh, particular question. Hausa states were also theocratic in a way. Some of the leaders had already converted to Islam, even though they have polytheistic history. And we know that what Danfodio felt was the perversion of the religion in how most of the leaders and the political elites behaved was part of the motivations for attempting the jihad 
even though what really kicked it off in your book is how they reacted you know to his teachings and his attempts at building what was largely a, a peaceful movement at first so my question to you would be now looking at how it played out and the workings of the caliphate itself how it was governed and everything which factor would you say weigh more heavily or became more apparent is it the religious slash theocratic element or the political element which emphasized reforms around taxes uh, around the rule of law and other things like that or would you grant equal way to both? It's an interesting question. And the reasons why we had that chapter, Caliphate in Session, was because we wanted to assess the Caliphate against its own objectives. You know, prior to the, the kickoff of the Jihad, Uthman Danfodio was a prolific commentator on affairs in his country and affairs in neighboring countries as well, in, in of the house of city states. By the way, they weren't exactly sort of Islamic states as of that time, right? They were poly, as you point out, they were polytheistic societies where you had some nominally Muslim rulers, but a lot of the political elite were non-Muslim. A lot of them were, you know, believers in traditional religion. And in fact, one of the driving forces, as you point out, for the jihad was the idea that many of these leaders were not sufficiently, and if you understand Islam, Islam is militantly monotheistic and a lot of these rulers were not dedicated to the worship of the only one god that exists and so that was a lot of the reason for the jihad now but to your point about assessing whether it was political factors or religious factors that were then driving affairs in the caliphate following it coming to being the reason we had that chapter caliphate in session was to do exactly that was to assess how does this caliphate rank in terms of what happened against its own ambitions against its own declarations prior to becoming the ruling power in the land. And what we found was that the caliphate failed in many ways on its own, if you judge it against its own standards, it failed in applying, you know, pure and strict Islamic jurisprudence to how affairs were governed in most of the caliphate. I mean, outside of the great city centers, you found that there was a lot of activity that was going on that was quite frankly not entirely under the control of the rulers of the caliphate. You had a lot of divergence in terms of how people reacted to and how people, a lot of the injustices that had been categorically denounced uh, prior to the jihad, a lot of those injustices continued to be in place. A lot of the taxes that had been condemned prior to the jihad, a lot of those taxes continued to be in place. A lot of the unfair actions and just a, a lot of the lack of justice for the common man that had been the central driving force of the jihad, a lot of those actions continued, a lot of those injustices continued in the post-caliphate era. And instead, what you had was a new political elite, a predominantly Fulani political elite, Islamic Fulani political elite that had now come into place as the rulers of this broad swath of land, a huge you know, amount of land bigger than any single elite had ever governed in this parts of the world up until that time. And then you had a self-sustaining political economy based on the interests and the objectives of that small political elite and their battles between themselves and against the outsiders that were always trying to usurp them for the entirety of the existence of the caliphate. And in many ways, the caliphate as a political system achieved its peak on the day it was formed and then weakened progressively until it was ultimately toppled by the British. And staying with that point on decline, would you say that there is also some kind of historical persistence in that because the Hausa states were not able to centralize before the attempt at building a caliphate? There was perpetual contestability and warfare going on. And even after the caliphate was formed, unification was very difficult. There was always insurgency to be put down. Can you say that that is some kind of persistence, historical, playing itself out, even despite the attempt to build a caliphate to centralize? 
I'll let you comment on this as well. But my take is that the you know diversity is the most fundamental thing about the country that we know as Nigeria, uh, including northern Nigeria as well. And a lot of people underestimate the amount, the sheer, you know, amount of diversity that we're talking about here. It is diversity of history, diversity of culture, diversity of beliefs, uh, diversity of political interests, diversity of religion. People just want to be independent. And this is a point I should have mentioned as part of, you know, what we lay out in that chapter, River of Rivers, or a river runs through it. People just want to be independent. In spite of this connecting rivers that we have, in spite of everything else, there's a fierce you know, interest in independence that has run through these lands for as long as anybody can remember. And in spite of the great efforts that have been made, particularly by the caliphate, to stamp out that diversity, to stamp out that independence, it continues to exist. And perhaps the moral of the story is that you have to lead this country and you have to lead these lands with diversity in mind. You can't get rid of it because it's so fierce and it has existed for generations, for centuries. And it is such a huge motivating factor that there is no amount really of violence that can get rid of it. And so the countries have to be governed with this in mind. Tofi, you can follow up on that. I think, you know, pretty much you've said what I would have said, you know, diversity is a feature, it's not a bug in Nigeria. It is hard coded into the country. It is everywhere in all parts of the country. You know, there are, like Fola mentioned, there are, there's diversity of language, of cultures, of tradition, of people, you know, so there is no getting around it. You might think that maybe you can stamp it out or you can suppress it, but, you know, it, it's just not going to happen. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, there were people who were in uprising against the caliphate for 100 years of the caliphate. And this was pretty much just nothing more complicated than saying, even if there's only 1,000 of us here, you know, we don't want to be subservient to anybody. And the British, again, when they came, they exploited this quite well. You know, when we talk about divide and rule, it's a bit simplistic. You know, there's some truth to it, but what it is is that British were able to tap into something that need, that want, that desire for independence that everybody had, you know, by simply promising people that, look, if you support us, we will allow you your freedom and independence. As soon as people heard that, they dropped everything else. It trumps. That need for independence, it trumps any need for cooperation. Even when it might be obvious that it might be better for people to cooperate and to give up a part of themselves, they want to be free. They want to be independent. They don't want to be under the dominance of anybody else. There was one of the many books that we went through in, in doing this. And there was one of the books by some British colonial officers that they put together about Northern Nigeria. So they basically tried to take a census of every different ethnic group they found and the different characteristics of those groups just in northern nigeria and also uh, almost hilarious in, in the sense that you know when you go through the book you see you know almost the kind of frustration of the british writer saying you know here is a group there's only 500 of them but they have their own language they have their own culture they have their own food they have their own tradition and they are independent you know and there were so many groups like that there were groups with hundred thousand people there were those with 200 people 500 1000 small groups like that and they were distinct I can't reiterate that enough. Diversity is a feature. And as we can see with recent events in Nigeria, you know, that independence trick, it can come out of nowhere, you know, and completely change the conversation about what you think is going on in the country. Even a matter that you might think has been long settled, you know, it can pop up anywhere. And the way people will react to it and carry on the argument, you will realize that people want to be masters of their own affairs, even if there's only five of them. You then take us from the caliphate to Egba. You know, I, I love this book so much. The narrative is so coherently woven together. Uh, in, in talking about the formation of Egba, and I know before getting to who I surmise to be for last favorite leader <laughs> <laughs> in the book, we know that Egba became, and Abeokuta particularly, became a, a sort of refuge city for people who were fleeing the violence that was coming out of the implosion of the Oyo Empire, so to speak. But briefly, what were the determinants of the implosion of Oyo Empire, so to speak? Why did the center fall apart, so to speak? 
This is an excellent yeah. question, uh, Toby. And by the way, just for listeners, a friend of uh, Fei and I, Tundile, Tundile has done some excellent, excellent research into the history and the ultimate collapse of the Oyo Empire. We also did a significant amount of research into this, but I'd recommend that people should also read Tundile's work on this. Oyo collapsed because of internal contradictions. Ultimately, the trigger event that led to the collapse of Oyo was the secession of Ilori under Afonja and the appending of Ilori to the Sokoto Caliphate as a way to defend itself against uh, Oyo. That was the ultimate trigger event, and that is well known in popular history. But I think what is less known, and this is where a lot of Chundil's work is amazing, is those internal contradictions, the prequel to Afonja's secession, because there was a lot of contestation between the Yoruba political elite. You had the merchant class, you had the constitutional monarch, the Alafi, and then you had the rest of the sort of religious and military elite that existed within the state. And there had been continuous tension and contestation between them. There was one particular political leader that managed to usurp several Alafins, the famous Bashar Ga. And this had weakened Oyo quite significantly over a period of time. Oyo used to be, prior to the time that we chronicle information, it used to be an amazing large empire that controlled a huge swath of land all the way to the sea where it was controlling a port in Wida, which is in present-day Benin Republic. And so this was a massive and highly successful empire, comparable at least in structure, if not in size, to the Sokoto Caliphate, uh, comparable to Benin at its height, which was another powerful empire in southern Nigeria. And so this was a powerful empire that unfortunately collapsed because of internal rivalry, which was then brought to the boil, if you like, by the secession of Ilori from Oyo in the early 19th century. So getting to it, uh, we meet because one of the things I also like about formation, if I can say, is that regular history books are usually about events. This is very much also a book about characters. We meet so many characters in the book and how their actions ultimately shaped the events that they participated in. So, And we meet a leader in Shodeke who I admire so much well, I just want you to give me a bit of insight into the person of Shodeke and how he led the way he did, particularly in trying to fashion a state that is not just based on military, he championed trade and education in the kind of partnerships that he sought, the kind of political machinations that he made. What can you tell us about him? You know, the story of Shodeke could be a whole book on its own, honestly. And we tried as much as possible to do justice to it, but I don't think we covered, you know, nearly as much as there is to cover on the subject. In an, an earlier draft of the book, I termed him George Washington of the Ebaz, and Bibi removed that term from the book, which I was okay with. But it was important to situate it in that context because it's a very similar type of character. So, you know, Shodeke was the leader of the Ebaz, even when they were in the so-called Egba forest, where they were subservient to the Oyo for many decades, probably centuries, prior to the time that we're covering in formation. So they were already a people. They were a people that were essentially, you know, subservient to the monarch in Oyo. But then when Ilori seceded and then Oyo erupted in violence, they were an independent people who, as we've pointed out already on, in this session all over the country you had people who always were looking for opportunities to be independent when oyo collapsed they immediately rose up in arms and they killed the leaders of the oyo amongst them the the so-called ajemi the ambassadors of, of the alafi that lived among them they killed those people and asserted their independence immediately and shodeke was the leader of that uprising but immediately they did that there were counter reactions from other parts of the empire and wars broke out, and they became the subject of so much violence and so much persecution. And they fought and kept fighting, but ultimately they left their homes where they had lived before in their forest and migrated away to find somewhere else where they could land. They moved very far to the south, closer to the coast. They left under Shodeke's leadership 
And then they settled at the place that we now know as Abelkota and formed a new sort of independent city-state, a new settlement there. Very small settlement, but very well protected by the, the mountains and the hills within which they settled. So geographically very favorable for what they wanted to do, which was to be independent and free. And Shudeke had no choice. So in, in response to your point about why did this man lead the way he led, in many ways he had no choice, right? So it's a small settlement. It's a settlement that is in danger of being you know, wiped off the face of the earth at any point in time by its enemies. And there were enemies from not just their former home country where they lived, but there were enemies to their, their west in Dahomey, where there was a very powerful ruler who saw them as an opportunity to just raid for slaves and ship all of them to the new world as slaves. Um, so they had to find a way to survive in that place. It was a very precarious situation. And the way to survive that they found was to ally themselves with foreign powers, to ally themselves with anybody that allows them to gain access to the coast, ultimately to Lagos, to gain access to a port, to be able to trade. And they were trading in all kinds of things. They were trading in slaves as well. I mean, Madame Tinumbu, the famous Madame Tinumbu slave trader, she traded in slaves as well as, you know, multiple other commodities. She was from Egba. She was an Egba woman. And this merchant elite, they wanted to trade and they needed to trade to be able to afford to protect themselves. And should they care, organize the country to allow people to trade, to allow independence to exist. Uh, it was a very convoluted structure in the end, but the central theme of it was that allow people to be independent and to maintain their independence and to trade. From how the Egba state emerged and ultimately shaped itself, because one big thing we talk about in Nigeria so much today is the question of leadership. Our leaders are this, are that. And now, looking at the politics of Egba information now, Faye, would you say incentive matters more than anything? Because, I mean, like Fola just described, this was a state that's basically under siege, you know, from the politics of Lagos, from the home from even the continuous fallout of Oyo and even the threat of the expanding caliphate. How important from this would you say incentives are in how leaders shape the future of their people? I think it's quite important because we've seen in history, uh, one of the things we've seen in history is that even some people who don't really have enemies. You know, we've seen countries where they don't really have enemies or nobody's really disturbing them, but uh, they have had leaders who've gone out of their way to create real or imagined enemies or to create a siege mentality in their people, you know, just to basically ginger their people, if you like, you know. I mean, we saw this, you know, probably the best example is uh, Lee Kuan Yew, who was constantly telling Singaporeans that we are under threat. Malaysia is going to invade us. Indonesia is going to invade us. You know, we're a tiny island here. If we don't buckle up, if we don't develop in time, you know, we'll be wiped off the face of the earth. And he kept telling his people that I don't know how true it was that Malaysia wanted to invade them or Indonesia wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth or anything of the sort, you know, I mean, they were one country previously, you know, so maybe there was some kernel of truth in it, but we could see that, you know, Lee Kuan Yew in particular, he, he over-egged it. So we might wonder why somebody who is at peace, who, who does not face any, you know, threat from their neighbors might want to create that siege mentality. I guess, uh, you know, the incentive is not just for the leadership, but for creating a collective sense of belonging in the people, you know, to try and get people to, quote and unquote, sleep and face the same direction, you know, incentivize the people to buy into a dream that you are creating. So it helps that, you know, I mean, in, in the case of Abel Okta, we can, there's, there's no doubt about it, that having all those enemies around them, being in mortal danger all the time, you know, probably made certain type of things unimportant you know so do you really as a leader you are in a small settlement you the only thing protecting you is the rocks and the hills around you but all the people around you need no encouragement to raid you for slaves and destroy you do you really 
want to focus as a leader in that kind of sense? Should your focus really be personal aggrandizement? Is that a place where you want to be corrupt? Just maybe, maybe just stealing money and not doing anything else, you know? Those kind of personal aggrandizement, I guess it goes down as a priority for you as a leader. And we saw how this shape should occur, you know, in the sense that he was a collegiate leader. He ruled by consensus, not by force of arms, that sort of thing. He got buy-in. For a lot of his policies and a lot of the things he did, he got a lot of buy-in. You know, so he was not a dictator. He was not. A, I mean, obviously, it was not democracy, but he was something closer to a, a, a first among equals, if you like. So, incentives they help to concentrate the mind. You know, I've always joked about this in the past that Nigeria, being in the middle of West Africa, being a giant, a big country that can pretty much overrun all the other countries. Maybe there's a sense of complacency that has built in over time. We are not under threat from anybody. Cameroon is not about to invade us. Chad or Niger Republic or, or Benin Republic. We are surrounded by very small countries and maybe even poor countries. So we've never really been under that kind of threat. And maybe the incentives have not really worked. We, we've seen this. And, you know, even with World War One and Two, we've seen how we have driven countries or the Cold War, if you like. That sense of imminent threat. You know, we've seen how it has shaped countries to drive technological improvement, drive economic development, constantly waking up and thinking that somebody wants to wipe you out. It, it concentrates the mind and it incentivizes, it lowers the status of a leader who is after personal aggrandizement and it raises the status of a leader who is who wants to create a sense of belonging and a shared identity for people. One other thing I found so startling in the book is the sheer scale of slave trade. One factor from the book mentioned that it's possible at a particular point in time that almost half of the population of the Sokoto Caliphate were slaves. I'll stick with Faye here. This is a point that you've consistently made in some of your writings, even your engagement on social media. Would you say that especially in researching and writing this book, would you say that here in Africa, in Nigeria particularly, we have faced a serious reckoning and conversation about how much our people are complicit in the slave trade? And if no, how can we really deploy history to change that? Well, I mean, I think the short answer to that is that no, we've not really had a reckoning. Using the word complicit might isolate it to the foreign trade, you know, so basically saying that, you know, when the Europeans came, they bought slaves, they took them away, that sort of things, you know, we were complicit in that, but I think complicit is probably not the best word, or in the sense that there was a slave trade, right, that was internal. That was part and parcel of culture, of religion, of everything else. And I, I always remind people, you know, that in Nigeria of today, slave trade, the internal slave trade, did not end until 1933, thereabouts. That was when we could probably say it was done and over, over with. That is within the lifetime of my father. So it is something that went on for a very long time. It was cultural and it was accepted. It was part and parcel of the fabric of who we were. Fola mentioned initially, you know, that it, it shaped architecture. The entire political economy was built around it. It was a normal way of life. What finally ended it was that people on the ground rejected it. For the depth of how much it was as part of the culture, no external force, I don't think, could have ended it alone. The British tried, to their credit, and probably, like I always say, probably the only the only useful thing that colonialism achieved in Nigeria was that singular attack on slavery, the institution of, but they could never have done it alone. When the people bought into the idea that, okay, maybe this is not a good idea, that was the end of it. But it took a long time to get. So we have had a reckoning with that in, in terms of the sense that what are the echoes of slavery today? How is it disturbing us even still? Many years after it has ended, how does it still affect who we are as a people today? There are a number of ways. Architecture, the way we, as a country, how you will find people living in all kinds of remote areas of the country. We have not been able to centralize the country whereby, in the sense that we're a poor country, 
if you are going to build, I always, I always use the example of last time I traveled from Abuja to Kaduna by road. On that stretch of road, you see random small communities living somewhere, just a small community as you drive past and then you drive on and then you don't see anything again and you don't see another small community again. And I kept thinking to myself that even a, a country where the state is fully formed and has capacity, there's enough state capacity, imagine if they wanted to pipe water or lay electricity to every random village everywhere. It would be difficult to get to places. I mean, even here in the UK, there are places where some smaller villages whereby broadband is difficult, for example, or even internet, mobile phone appendition is difficult. So you see, capacity, state capacity starts to weaken when you have to deal with all these smaller groups. And yet in Nigeria, we have so many of them, partly as a legacy of slavery because isolating yourself was a good way to protect yourself from being raided. Back in the day, so if you isolate yourself in a mountain or a hilly area somewhere, then your chances of survival were much higher. You know, so we have not really dealt with things like that, and those things affect how we are organized today as a country. And there are so many other different ones. So, if we, I don't know how we could start the conversation. It's pretty difficult. People take it personally, or I think one of the things we try to explain in the book, and which we mentioned very early on, is that it is very very difficult to find a group of people a tribe or a culture that did not participate in the slave trade both external and internal once we can accept that then we know that we are coming at it from a point of we're not pointing blame we're not trying to say oh house has read yorubas or yorubas read Igbos or everybody read no no we don't want to i think that would be a wrong way to start the conversation we want to understand that this was something we did to ourselves as a people and we want to reckon with how it is still affecting us today just so that we can have a future that is better we can fix whatever problems might come around from centuries of keeping a huge part of the population in subservience in bondage how do we begin to fix that to give people to level up individuals everyone and say look you know you are a human being and you deserve everything you deserve education you deserve to live a decent life and the and you know the pursuit of happiness as a Nigerian and as a person. So I think that would be the way we will need to start the conversation, not accusatory, but just as an admission of what we did to ourselves individually. We enslaved each other, we enslaved other people. If we start off from there, then maybe we can have a record. I don't know that there's any leader on the horizon now that can even begin to broach the conversation, but you know, the work is there if anybody wants to put their hands to the plow and start it. Speaking of the abolition movement from that slavery question, and we encountered the Christian Mission Society. And of course, the freed slaves on the high waters who were living in Syria alone got educated and then came back to Nigeria and in helping build and collaborate with local elites, especially in Egba. You know, and we meet the person of Bishop Crowder, who I imagine can take an entire book on its own if you guys could write it to paraphrase one of you you have called him one of the most important nigerians to have ever lived me to bundle two questions for you for La. in the workings of the christian mission to nigeria we know that they were expanding the religion of christianity but also expanding education you know we saw the emergence of an educated middle class via this fruitful collaboration, I would say. And then we get to the navigation of the Niger and how they kept expanding, the British influence and interest kept expanding. And to take a chapter from the book, Exit the Bible, Enter the Gun, when did things change? And was it palm oil that really flipped the switch? Um, that's an excellent question, Toby, and, and I'll answer it. But there's something from the prior conversation that I wanted to add before we, we get to that. And when we talk about this issue of the legacy of, of slavery that we uh, continue to live with today, I think one of the most insidious aspects of this is in terms of gender relations in this country. And you know, there's an amazing book that talks about slavery in Lagos and the political economy of slavery in Lagos by an American woman called Christine Mann. I forget the title of the book now, but it's one of the sources for formation. And it talks about the historical 
uh, city of Lagos and the political economy of that place in relation to slavery. In particular, it focuses a lot on how essentially all of the women in that society were treated as chattel, you know. So the, even the concept of marriage was in itself about purchasing a person, was a, purchasing an addition to your stock of humans. And so even a lot of what we contend with today in terms of the relations between men and women and a lot of issues that feminist activists deal with, a lot of them have their history also in this legacy of, of slavery in this country. So I, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Now to your point about Crowther and about the Christian Missionary Society and Exit the Bible, Enter the Gun. It's a fascinating topic, which again, we tried our best to begin that conversation in formation. It's a very complicated subject because people often say, if you remember, you would have heard that when the white man came, they came with the Bible and they came with a gun, etc. And then they, you know, we closed our eyes and next thing we, we knew, they're taking our land. And it's a very popular sort of meme that people use to talk about colonization. The reality is much more complicated. And that's what we tried to do was to introduce that nuance to the conversation and formation. And CMS, one of the most important institutions in the history of Nigeria. The folks behind CMS uh, in England are people like Henry Venn, who was you know, one of the most important CMS leaders. They were very deliberate about what they wanted to do in this part of the world. For them, it was as much about spreading Christianity. Obviously, these guys were Christian evangelists, so Christianity was fundamental to what they were doing. But it was also about changing the political economy of these places, because they understood that the only way you could end slavery is not simply by interdicting ships on the high seas. It's not simply about an edict uh, declaring the end of slavery, because this was central and fundamental to how even the political elite saw themselves. So you had to create a new political economy. And a lot of what they were trying to do, a lot of the career of Bishop Crowther was not just about Christian evangelism. I mean, Bishop Crowther started hundreds of schools in the South, in the West, in the East, all the way up the river, as far as Lokoja. Uh, this man was interacting and trying to evangelize in, in Adamawa and in places uh, you know, further up the, the Niger and the Benue. But it was not just about you know, education and Christianity. It was also about trade and about creating opportunities for political elites to engage with the rest of the world, the Western world, creating new value chains, integrating these economies into the global economy were all essential to what Bishop Crowther was trying to do. I talked about palm oil as well and exit the Bible, enter the gun. A lot of what happened was that imperialism was an ideology that developed a life of its own in England, uh, in the United Kingdom, and we, we chronicle some of the evolution of the idea of imperialism in England and how it came to the fore of the political conversation. Those folks, once they developed their ideology and their strategy, which was purely an economic strategy about how to get rich, it was capitalism, how to get richer and how to make more money and how to use British power to influence their profitability of their businesses. Once they developed that ideology, they co-opted a lot of the language of the people who had gone before them, the missionaries, the explorers, the scientific people who had initially first been the ones to come to West Africa. They co-opted a lot of the language of what those people were trying to do, of what the CMS, so a lot of what I said about what the CMS was trying to do in Nigeria, the imperialists co-opted that language. Even though they were trying to do something entirely different, they were trying to make money. And it was about palm oil, it was about shipping in manufactured goods. It was about shipping in weapons. It was about selling manufactured produce and exporting raw materials. That's what imperialism was about. And you needed to control the trade flows. You needed to control these lands, ultimately, which led to colonialism. And so there was a point, and we tried to chronicle that point in formation, where the switch happened between the ideology of people like Henry Venn and the CMS missionaries and the ideology of men like Joseph Chamberlain, who was very clear about what his intentions were. The intentions were to establish British trade hegemony in these lands by military force where necessary, by foreign investment if necessary, but over and above anything else by controlling trade flows and controlling the lands from which these trade materials were originating and the destination of these manufactured goods. This will be my final question. So I want to get an answer from both of you, starting with Faye. 
staying with UF Fola ended that answer. Given that motivation for colonialism and how things change, would you then say that that is the internal logic of amalgamation, of sewing together this diverse set of people and geography into a singular entity and administering them? Would you say it is that change in ideology and the philosophy of colonialism, that change in the motive of engagement, that change in how the British intervened, would you say that is the internal logic? Was that the entire reason why amalgamation did happen? I would have loved to talk about Lugard, but given how overrated he is, maybe let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> if you can take a stab at that, was that why Nigeria was soon together? Because so many people will insist to you that this is still an artificial construct and that's why we are struggling the way we are today. Well, I'll say yes and yes and then maybe no. In the sense that, first of all, I think the first point I always like to make is that all countries are artificial. If you think that joining Nigeria, North and Southern Nigeria, for an accounting decision is bad, you need to hear about how some other countries came to be. There are war stories out there. It's not the end of the world. You play the hand you're dealt. So yes, that was the internal logic in the sense that you can think of it as a venture capital fund, for example, today. Imagine you run a venture capital fund. You are invested in one startup that uh, runs restaurants, and then you are invested in another startup that has an agri business that grows foods and sell. At some point, you sit in that, even if those two companies don't know each other, at some point, you looking at it and say, hmm, there might, there's some synergy here. Since we have a company here that sells agri products, and then we have another company here that sells food, maybe we can find synergies between them, join them together, let the, the food guy sell directly to the restaurant guy, cut down costs. Maybe there are some things that are being duplicated. And this is what private equity, venture capital, this is what, what they all do. They buy a company because they think that they can cut costs somewhere. So from the point of view of the British, the North belonged to them, the South belonged to them. And they found out that they were doing a lot of inefficient movement of capital, if you like, in the sense that the Southern part had a surplus sent to London. And then Lugard in the North was constantly asking for money to run the north because he never had enough you know he could all raise enough from taxes so subventions were coming down from london and all that i was like okay since we own this too and this was again driven by the fact that in those days like you know the, the zeitgeist the idea back then unlike today where most countries are most developed countries will raise their biggest source of revenues from income taxes back then it was custom duties and excise taxes that was how people raised money in those days in governments raised money so if you had a coast you automatically had an advantage under that kind of system because the north did not have a coast so there was just no other way for it to raise money on a comparable level with the south so obviously somebody in london eventually said oh okay we own the south we own the north and we are seeing the way this money is moving and it's moving inefficiently let's join them together and combine it into one create some synergies cut some costs and create one country so that was really it. it was an accounting decision but like i say when people want to get angry about it i can understand but please be mindful and understand that there are war stories out there. There's no perfect country where people were formed because they thought, oh, hmm, we like each other, we are we are perfect together, let's come together, shake hands, and we think that we can form, a, you know, I mean, most a lot of countries, especially in the 19th century, it was either conquest or it could be just a flimsy decision. You look at the Soviet Union, for example, the former Soviet Union, Stalin, one of the things that Joseph Stalin did was that he basically created countries because he wanted Russia to have power over all of them. And one way he figured that he could do that was by making sure that in every country he created, one ethnic group was not totally dominant. He balanced it, so he balanced this kind of 52, 48 type of thing just to make sure that, so that they were constantly fighting each other rather than fighting Moscow. So he just created a kind of divide and rule. And that's how so many countries were formed. Many of them are still surviving today. Many of them have found a way forward, even with those contradictions. Or many of them are still struggling with the inheritance that they got from Stalin. It's the way of the world. Nigeria is not unique in the sense of bringing disparate people together for a flimsy reason. Now, what we want to do with it, it's entirely up to us. We want to keep it together, make it work. It's up to us. We want to break it up and say, no, we want to undo 
what the British did and go our separate way. It's up to us. Right now, it is our decision to make. But yes, that was our starting point and that was the internal logic. I'll take it from there and, and I'll say the following, which is that one of the things we try to show in formation is that a lot of the issues that we are dealing with in Nigeria today actually predate amalgamation. And for me, the most important of all those issues, or perhaps the one that summarizes and synthesizes all of those issues into one word, is injustice. Injustice has existed and has been a motivator for unhappiness, a motivator for wars, a motivator for people to protest, a motivator for people to rise up in arms for centuries. We talk about the injustice of slavery, but then even after that, a lot of the politics of all of the countries that then came together to be amalgamated into North, well, originally countries that came together to form Northern Nigeria and Southern Nigeria as protectorates and then colonies. And then ultimately the country, Nigeria, that was formed from the amalgamation of those two artificial constructs because Southern Nigeria itself was an artificial construct just as much as Northern Nigeria was an artificial construct. But then you, you now have it all together. One thing that has been common across the histories of all these peoples is injustice. And that injustice continues to be with us today. So rather than focus on the artificial constructs of the countries, because the country of Southern Nigeria itself was an artificial construct, I focus on the reasons why people were unhappy then and why people are unhappy now. And I also focus on those periods of times when we've seen economic growth, economic development, we've seen transformation in the lives of people. What was it that was happening in those brief periods of time, like the Clapham sect era that we, we lay out in formation? What was the difference in terms of how this place was governed in that period of time? And that, I think, is what we ought to focus on. And indeed, if we want to restructure Nigeria, we, we, we change the shape of Nigeria, the focus for me would not be a geographical change. It would be a change that is attempting to solve problems like injustice. And on that note, thank you so much for La Faguli and Feifa Waimi for participating in the Arts and Book Festival 2021 online edition. It's always fascinating talking to you guys, and I know we can do this for hours on end. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us, and it was a pleasure. Five Minutes Madness, only you can understand. Spectre. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre, loans in five minutes.